Excellent. Very cool. Hey, Ari, how are you doing today? Good, Rachel. How are you? <laughs> Good. Well, we're getting started a little bit late, but I want to ask people who are already in the room to let us know where you're coming from. I see that Elzo is in the Netherlands and Sandra is in Minnesota. So if you are here and live, let us know where you're coming, where you're listening from. Hey, Judith, you're from Chicago and, and not from Anna's from L.A. That's right. Oh, someone close by. <laughs> that's true. Is there anyone here from in San Francisco? Because that's where Ari is right now. And Erica is in Los Angeles. So we got a couple LA people, one from Chicago, which is awesome. It's pretty much nice everywhere. How is it in Nether in the Netherlands? I hope it's nice and warm at that time, at this time. <laughs> yeah. How is the weather up there in San Francisco? It's been okay the past couple days, but we haven't really had summer yet. It should be coming in September as usual. Oh my gosh. Um, it's been very cold the last couple weeks. And I actually started putting away my winter clothes mm -hmm. like last month because we had a little spurt of sunshine and then I regretted it. <laughs> so. I've been wearing coats and scarves and stuff. And you're wearing a sweater today. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so different from LA. It's been pretty warm here. Yeah, it's very different. We have a very unique microclimate in San Francisco. Well, that's really nice. It sounds nice. Yeah. When you say it sounds exotic, but it's <laughs> actually just cold. <laughs> so can you let us know where you're sitting right now? I'm sitting in the Adobe office in San Francisco, which is in Soma, South of Market. Um, I'm sitting in a room that's near my desk where we, it's a, called a breakout room. So you can't reserve it, you just kind of walk in. But I put a little sign outside that said, don't come in <laughs> oh, <laughs> between this time because I'm doing something. So <laughs> Got it. I have reserved it. I've broken the rules today. Okay. And you're sitting in front of a Typekit uh, icon. This is a Typekit oh. neon sign. Neon sign, right. It nice. was crafted by Sally Kerrigan, who is our editor. Mm -hmm. And she went to a neon workshop with Typecamp a couple uh -huh. months ago. And then um, Shelly Grunler showed up with this. <laughs> Oh, a few cool. weeks later, she had a big yeah. box and she unveiled the sign. It was completed by the Neon Camp instructor. So oh, that's awesome. now we have it displayed proudly. Not <laughs> usually in this room, but today I wanted to show it off. That's nice. And, and yeah, also behind nice. it is a type case. Yes, of course. I mean, I carry this type case everywhere with me just so people know, you know, right. what I do. Exactly. It's a good business card. <laughs> <laughs> okay, has so, my name on the back. <laughs> so uh, just before we get started, there's quite a few people in the room, but I know there's more people who are registered for this event. If you guys can help us out and share the event, there's a share button underneath our video feed. Um, just let everyone know that we're already live and we're going. And so um, that would help us to fill up the room before we get officially get started. Also, there's a questions and topics tab underneath and just use that to ask questions of Ari. And at the end, we'll be giving away a free year to Creative Cloud. Creative Cloud. Yeah, so depending on the question that you ask, wow. <laughs> so we'll find you out. Better ask interesting questions. Better ask really interesting questions, yeah. <laughs> Surprise me. I don't right. know how to judge what the best question is, but we'll see. Do you get questions often? I don't have a lot of opportunities to interact with customers, mm -hmm. okay. unfortunately, but I do love that. I love doing it at conferences and um, in my day-to-day -day life, I don't interact with designers very much or people who use our products. So when I do find someone that I say I work at Adobe and they have something to say about our products, I'm like, oh, you use our software. Mm -hmm. So I try to get as much out of that as I can, but it, this is a great opportunity for me to engage with people who might want to learn more. Great, great. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's just get started. Um, thank you all for joining us and the Topography Dojo. I'm your host, Rachel Elnar, also a producer of the Type Ed Topography Education Program here in Los Angeles. And today I'm joined by Ari Ramundakis. Is that correct? Pretty good. No, yeah. what, what, how would you say it? Ramundakis. Ramundakis. You said it. Fine. <laughs> I mean, and she's in charge of foundry relations um, as manager at Typekit. And she's going to give us today a sneak peek at the inner workings of Typekit and how she works with the uh, font foundries. So thank you, Ari, for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. So you have a couple things to show us, and I will share yeah. this right now. I just wanted to give a little overview of some of the foundries we've added in the past year. Mm -hmm. And I've only been in this job for about, uh, God, I always forget how long it's been, but this current job for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I've, I'm proud of some of the foundries that I, that we onboarded since I've been in this role. Mm -hmm. So these are the ones that, I would like to highlight, there's a lot more that we've added, but these are some of the ones I'm proud of partnering with. Okay, so let me just focus uh, in on this and then we'll get started. So, so okay. this is Fort Foundry. Mm -hmm. um, Maddox approached us last year and he has a selection of typefaces that are very popular. Um, the style is pretty desirable, I've noticed, and it's trending <laughs> at the moment. Um, the layered typefaces and the, um, the, the ones that you would expect to see on a liquor store, <laughs> on an alcohol bottle, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. which he actually names them names like bourbon. So... I don't feel bad saying that. Um, um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see Fort Foundry's page on Typekit. This is what it looks like. Mm. And his typeface industry, which is highlighted here, has actually risen into some of the top typefaces that have been synced um, in the past few months which is pretty awesome for a, an independent foundry that was recently added to Typekit. Um, he joins the ranks of some of the foundries that have been our partners for years. So I'm really proud of that and I'm happy for Maddox. Um, he's an awesome guy and it's great to see what our customers do with these fonts. So can, before we get um, further into this, can I ask how he approached you and um, what made you decide that he should be part of the Typekit family? Yeah, um, he emailed us, I believe. It's been a while, okay. so I don't remember exactly, but I think he emailed us and he was very clear with, hey, here are my typefaces. That's something that surprisingly a lot of people don't do is actually show us what typefaces they want to add a lot of people say i'm a designer my name is so and so i would love to be part of typekit and then i have to google their name or respond being like so do you like, do you design typefaces or what do you do? Yeah. um i think he sent us some specimens and he had um, the specimen that I just showed you, I created for our blog, but on his own website, he has some beautiful specimens and his site is pretty great. It's designed really well. And that's something that immediately is impressive. Of course, the typefaces speak for themselves, but when a designer is able to display them in a really attractive way, um, of course, that makes a difference. It's like when you go to an open house and it's all beautifully decorated, right. um, you, your eye is drawn to that. So I remember looking at his website originally and saying, wow, he's a really talented guy mm -hmm. and this stuff looks pretty good. So, so it's all in the presentation. It doesn't really have to do with how long he's been in the business or how many typefaces he has or anything like um, that. I think that does play a role. Mm -hmm. um, usually 
when we see someone that doesn't have a really large portfolio, that makes us hesitant to partner with them. Mostly because partnering with someone takes a lot of work. Okay. And um, we like to make sure that our customers get a lot out of that. And when it's, for example, one display face that is cool, but we don't know how much it will be used, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we might not have the bandwidth to work on making them a partner. I see. So um, that is a factor. Um, <laughs> length in the in years in the industry, I don't really look at, but that does produce a larger portfolio. So indirectly, experience is a factor. So experience, portfolio, how you display your fonts, how you conduct yourself, mm -hmm. um, and asking the right questions, letting, making it so that I don't have to do so much work right. for you. That's something that I value in a new partner. Mm -hmm. And it's not always the case, but when I do have someone that is really on top of things and responds really quickly and that helps. knows what to ask, yeah, mm -hmm. of course right. it helps. Of course, cool. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay. All right, um, Jamie Clark. Jamie Clark is a friend of our former teammate, Elliot Stocks. Um, and I believe Elliot recommended him a while back, over a year ago. And so we partnered with him. He has, this is an example of someone having one extended family rather than a larger portfolio. But we really liked this typeface and it does fall within this trend of chromatic or layered typefaces that's super popular right now. And he does a great job of it. One thing that I really like is that he provides combinations that are already created so that if you want to combine, I mean, they're right here. But the text is super small. But um, the three that you see here are actually families on Typekit. So you don't have to do too much work in Photoshop, Photoshop or Illustrator or whatever you're using to put those together. And the next page is his page. So you combine some of the typeface. Are you saying that he's combined some of the characteristics of the fonts he's, in order to go ahead? So each of the separate variations are components of what you see here. So mm -hmm. there's the, the outline and the shading and the lines in the middle. They're all different variations in the family and he's created combinations to put them all together so that you don't have to do too much work yourself. It's great. Or you can combine them in different ways. Yeah. It's a really beautiful face. It's really, it's really yeah. nice. It's very um, uh, historic in a way, right? And uh, there's a currency aspect to it. Yeah, that's true. Beautiful. It has that historic aspect, but it's also very trendy. Mm. And so how do you know when something is quote unquote trending? I don't actually know, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know for sure, but I see a lot of submissions of this kind of thing. Mm. A lot of people email us with these kind of typefaces. Um, I see them in a lot of designs and online. So just from a, just anecdotally. Right, so from a type designer's point of view, you're seeing, you're seeing many type designers submit these or, or design these and they're submitting them yeah. to you. But from a designer's side, do you see a lot of people syncing these types of um, fonts? Are they being used a lot? I don't have statistics on that, okay. but I do see interest in them. Mm. Um, we also introduced a lot. I'm not. In, I'm not showing any new additions from existing partners. Mm -hmm. I'm just showing new partners. But we had a few new typefaces from Jim Parkinson recently, mm -hmm. which is Sutro, which is also a layered face, and we've seen a lot of interest in those as well. Okay, it's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is an interesting one. Um, Brian Wilson creates 
um, historically inspired script fonts, some of which are actually based on handwriting of historical figures. And he approached us a few years ago and we weren't able to work on it yet, but um, we added his fonts last year. And I think it's something very unique and very inspiring because the amount of work that goes into it, the amount of research um, really produces this result that you can't find anywhere else. And these are from his own website. I really like the map at the top because it really looks original and handwritten, but it's using his font antiquarian scribe. Okay. And this is his page? Yes, so he has a few about 15 typefaces on there. And do you know further about what he's doing? Is he actually finding these scripts in, um, in old maps and he's just replicating them? I'm not sure exactly his process. I know that he does a lot of research, yeah. but I don't know what the origins of each different typeface is. I know that some of them, like Emily Austin, for example, is supposed to be based on a person's handwriting. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure about each one. I think on his website, on Three Islands Press, he mm -hmm. does have a lot of text and background on each one. This is such a great project. Yeah, it's really yeah. cool. Love it. OK. And then BAT, so Jean-Baptiste Levey was referred to us by Frank Grieshammer, who is our awesome teammate here at Typekit. And these are some of his typefaces. These are specimens that I created for our blog. Um, the one on the top is Aesir, the one that says I am 20s. And that's mm -hmm. another layered one mm -hmm. um, that you can combine in different ways. And the other ones are Instant and Adso. And we really like people like Jean-Baptiste who are independent type designers. Um, he's a young guy who has a great portfolio and we're happy to be partnering with him. Okay. There's Ace here. Mm -hmm. And then you can go to the next one. Device fonts. So device is a really established foundry in the UK. And um, Ryan had reached out to us. We have a, an email that's foundries at typekit.com that you can find on our website. And that points to um, our support software, which we use Desk for support. So I log in there every day and see what, who has emailed foundries at typekit. And one day it was Ryan. So um, he just reached out saying, I've had a lot of customers asking about my fonts being available on Typekit and just wanted to know a little bit more about our service. So we ended up working with him. These are some of the specimens I created for our blog post. And I had a lot of fun with these, especially Quagmire, which is on the top left. I don't mm -hmm. know why, but I just love that one. Um, I wanted to highlight one of them that wasn't his most popular, so mm -hmm. I did that. So he's and, doing both display and text face. Yeah, right. he has a very large portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, Paralucent, of course, is his, one of his most popular ones, mm -hmm. and that's been there's been a lot of interest in that one. And I was laughing because I've been going to this burrito place in San Francisco, Papalote, for a while. And after I started talking to device fonts, I realized that they use this font on the bottom right, Black Current, oh, wow. for their logo. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, you must see this in surprising places. And he said, you have no idea. <laughs> but that's fun to know that it's at a burrito place in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. So you can go in that case. Oh, There's yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Black Current, very, very. Of uh, unique, very distinctive, very yeah. distinct. Yeah, like yeah. it has a sixties, seventies feel. Totally. Wow, that's great. Okay. So next, and then emigre. This was a big one for us. I bet. 
and we're really happy we have the whole Emma Gray library on Typekit. The only fonts that we don't include are the pattern fonts mm -hmm. because we don't have a way to make them easy to use. So we haven't included those, but we have everything else from Emma Gray and it was a pleasure to work with them. We started having conversations with them earlier this year and they are eager to expand their reach and we love everything about them and yeah. our, our users do too. That's pretty exciting actually. I really, I mean, yeah. a lot of these type cases bring back memories. <laughs> so these, yeah, are, they've been around. these are available both um, on as synced for the desktop and also as web fonts? Yes, they're available for both. We are hoping to have all of our new additions available for sync as well as web. Mm -hmm. And we've achieved that so far this year. I don't think we have more than a hundred new fonts that are web only. Um, we've added 1,177 <laughs> Oh new fonts this year. Yeah, so we've wow. been doing really well adding new stuff. Um, 500 are from Emigre, <laughs> about. But we've added almost all of those for both sync and web. We really want to make sure our customers have that have that availability. 500 are from Emigre? Wow, what a huge number. I think around 490 yeah. something. Wow. It's so huge. We've seen Mrs. Eves on as a uh, web type now and hopefully people use it large enough that we can read that's all that's just my <laughs> comment so <laughs> yes everybody who's listening yeah. it's very tiny <laughs> yeah okay and then this was one of our more recent ones this has all been kind of in chronological order um, we added Laura Worthington's fonts we don't have her whole library but we have a good selection and I love creating specimens with these um, this is some of the stuff I did for our blog. And the one on the right is for our coworker, Molly, mm -hmm. because her name looks awesome in Hummingbird. <laughs> you get to use all those cool little flourishes. Oh, um, those are nice. Those are extra glyphs? Yeah, they're alternates. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. So if you look at some of her fonts, such as um, a I mean, all of the scripts, Hummingbird, mm -hmm. Adorn, and you see all the alternates. For for example, for the lowercase p, there might be like seven different kinds. Oh my gosh. So it's amazing the work that she puts into them and the commitment that she has um, just to make it look, it looks super handwritten because you can have one word with so many different variations every time. So, well, the alternates, you can really make things look custom. Definitely. Yeah, um, beautiful. And I met Laura at Adobe Max, where mm -hmm. I met you last year. Mm -hmm. And I took her workshop, and it was really awesome to see her process when she actually does hand lettering and how that translates into her fonts. And they're really, even though they are software, I feel like she puts so much of herself into it that it's a live thing. And it's great to have her as a partner. Yeah, beautiful work. Yeah. That's beautiful work. OK, so let me close this. I think that's it. OK, great. Let me close this. OK, so we got Neil, who just joined us. Thank you, Neil. Hello. Hello. And we also have um, one question from Judith. If anyone else has any questions, please put them underneath the um, the questions and topics tab. Uh, we'll be giving away a free, I mean, not a free, giving away a year of Creative Cloud. <laughs> it, it, it will be year. free. It will be free. Yeah, it'll be free. So feel free to um, enter your questions. So I just have a couple questions for you. So when people submit type, their typefaces, their font designs to you. What has to be done in order to bring it into the into the system? So first of all, we have to review it. And we have a few awesome people here that are at our fingertips, such as Frank Grieshammer, Miguel Souza, Ivan Betger, who is our Typekit library manager, has the final say, yeah. um, Tim Brown. So we have a little group that we 
talk to. At the moment, we are trying to make this a more established system of having meetings. But right now, I kind of go on Slack and say, hey, this person submitted this font. What do you guys think? And it's a really quick way for people to give their feedback. So I get feedback. Ivan has the final say. Mm -hmm. And then we decide, OK, we're going to start talking to this person seriously. They have to sign an NDA so we can give them all the terms. And as soon as they, there's an understanding, because a lot of questions arise and we have to talk through it. When we have that understanding, then we have them sign a contract with us and get their font files, load them, and then release it. But this can take anywhere from a month to who knows, depending on <laughs> how many questions they have and how long, how many fonts there are. For example, mm -hmm. with Emma Gray, with that many fonts, loading them took a long time. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a lot to deal with. And do they also provide you formats for web fonts as well? Or is we that something else that you No, we only require an OTF file. And then oh, we actually do very minimal processing, but we are able to do the rest ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. pretty cool. I mean, the Emigre uh, library must library have taken a long time. long time. It took a while. There were a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> Which are not my forte, but I had. Is there anything there you're looking, looking for, for in terms, in terms of, of curating, curating the library? The library? Like, like you're trying to, trying to achieve a certain, achieve a certain look, look or variety? variety? Mm -hmm. We don't have a specific strategy. For example, we need to add this many more geometric sans serifs. Um, but we do try to create a variety for our customers because we have so many million customers now who are Creative Cloud members, we have a large cross-section of people. So there isn't, it's not just web designers anymore. It's people who are using the fonts for all sorts of media and desktop as well as web. So just creating that variety, making sure that there are very high quality fonts, um, making sure that our partners have something that's going to be used very much or as of a lot of interest or have a large portfolio that will satisfy our customers. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. Yeah. So what I'll do so is we'll I'll go through, through the questions. Sure. I'm hearing a little bit of echo. Are you guys hearing some echo? Just let me know if there's some issues, but it could be just my microphone. I don't know. Are you hearing anything, Ari? No. no Am I echoing? Okay. No, you're not. Sometimes I get some echo. So uh, what I'll do is I'll go through the questions. And this way, I don't ask you questions that people have. So yeah. Judith is asking. Oh, see, Anna said that she did hear an echo. OK. So Judith is saying, I see more super families and layered fonts lately. Are you looking more to partner with designers making these? As a designer, as a new designer, do you recommend I not focus on single face fonts, display faces, what is more desirable to you and the market? Um, that's hard to say. It's, it's not cut and dry. But I have been seeing a lot of submissions that are super families. That's just what happens. Now it's so easy to design multiple variations that I think people just do it <laughs> and it is desirable. I think that I would prefer seeing a really well-designed large family to just having one variation um, that would seem more desirable to me, but that doesn't mean that it would be used more by our customers. It depends on the typeface, of course. Um, when I do get submissions from someone that just include one display face that has one variation that does give me pause. And I think, OK, even if this is a really cool, as I said earlier, even if this is a really cool typeface, is it going to be used? Is it going to really enhance our customer's creative process right. enough for me to make this happen, this partnership happen? And 
usually that's it's a no. And unfortunately, so our process for partnering with, with new designers, new designers is, kind is kind of cumbersome. cumbersome. So, so hopefully in the future, in the future it'll be easier to say yes to new mm. typefaces. Yeah. Um, so Anna said that you were going out a little bit and now you're back. Okay. <laughs> so I'm sure. oh, I love the technical issues on webinars. Yeah. Just okay. a bit of echo. Hmm. Yeah, that's what she's saying. That's okay. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree with you on single face fonts. It's a little bit difficult as a designer to work with single face fonts because you're always searching for good pairs. With super families, much, makes it much easier for us yeah. as designers. So, um, I think that's a wonderful thing that you guys do. Um, Judith, I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, great, excellent. Uh, so Johnny is asking, in terms of licensing, is there a plan that would allow an individual or firm to use Typekit on their own websites as well as clients' websites and even printed marketing material? Or would the clients need their own subscription to Typekit? That's a great question. A very good question, Johnny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we do have both. I believe that a lot of designers design for their clients and that could create a problem when they finish their project or their subscription lapses and then the company is like hey our fonts are you know under this guy's account so i do think that it is easier if the client has a creative cloud subscription which includes typekit so they would have their own access to the fonts but um it can go both ways. And um, I may not be answering exactly the question. I Let's kind see. of forgot. <laughs> okay, so if question. you look underneath the um, video feed, the yeah, question is there. I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so when you just... anybody's subscription allows them to use Typekit on different domains. The only thing is that you have a limit of page views that you can have on each plan. So the plan that comes with Creative Cloud has a certain limit of, I don't remember exactly the number of page views, but you can look it up at typekit.com slash plans. Mm -hmm. And if you, you can also get unlimited page views, but that's a much more expensive plan. Um, so you can have, you can be designing for a client and have multiple domains, but if that client is a large website, then you don't want that to impact your own account if you have a lot of page views. So that is possible, but it would probably be better for the company to have their own account. And then you would also have Creative Cloud and you would have access to the same fonts. So you would be able to design something for them and they would have the kit on their own Typekit account. Right. So on an extension of that question, so if I had a Typekit account and my clients um, are asking me to design some marketing material. So if I design marketing material for the client, mm -hmm. does the ULA of the, um, of the Typekit cover the fonts that I'm using for their marketing material or no, I have to, they have to get their own account. Does that make sense? Cause typically when well, you purchase fonts- We do commercial use is included in the Typekit terms of use. Oh, okay. So you can design fonts for t-shirts or billboards or any commercial use. Mm -hmm. um, but if uh, this is a question that comes up a lot, so I'll mention it. If you're designing something and you're sending it to a printer, the printer does have to have their own creative cloud access or type kit access to be able to print those materials. Got it. So it doesn't package up the fonts and send it to. No, you, you can't, can't send it to the printer. Okay. Okay. Johnny, I hope that answers your question. Okay, yes, he says. <laughs> uh, Anna is asking, what has been your most challenging assignment as an employee of Adobe? Oh, that's a good oh. one. <laughs> My most challenging. Um, I think that this new role has been, well, I was at Adobe before I started this role as an executive assistant to Jeff Veen and Brian Mason, who were 
founders of Typekit and then moved on to have their own roles at Adobe that were overarching VP roles. Um, so I did that job for a while. And then when I transitioned into this role, this was a lot more challenging because I had to learn about the product. I had to learn about fonts. There's a lot to <laughs> learn. <laughs> and generally about business practices and the legal aspect of contracts and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. I would say that the whole role has been challenging when I look at my whole career at Adobe, which has only been four years, but the last years, mm -hmm. a couple of years. Um, of this role, one of the most challenging things is the coordination of all the different aspects. So there is the accounting aspect of paying the foundry. There is the legal of contracting with them. There's the reviewing of the typefaces themselves. And keeping that all coordinated is pretty challenging. Do you also take care of the marketing of the foundries as well, or no? We are, the marketing that we do is basically creating a blog post and tweeting about it, tweeting about the release. Mm -hmm. And I usually write those blog posts. So, but I have a lot of help from Sally Kerrigan, the creator of the neon sign and editor of our blog. <laughs> so that's great. She helps a lot. But mm -hmm. yeah, I would say that I coordinate when the marketing goes out as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of different things that people don't realize that happen right. behind the right. scenes. Just so designers can use type. That's so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that's our goal. <laughs> okay, Anna, I hope that helps. Marta is asking, are you planning to provide any statistics about the typefaces showing how trending ones are and how often they are used for web and what kind of websites they're being added? Hmm. Which weights are most popular in what size certain fonts are mainly used any comparison most popular font combinations I think about information or feedback that can both help type designers to decide what to choose as the next project but also provide clients and graphic designers with some statistics that's an interesting one I don't believe that we've provided any of that uh, info before but that's something that I could ask about. One of the things we do have is a list. We have lists. If you go on typekit.com, um, on the top menu, there is a couple options. One of them is lists. And if you mm -hmm. click there, there is one that's called popular fonts. Mm -hmm. So that is, I believe it's curated, but it also has some kind of algorithm in there mm -hmm. that shows you what people are using. And you can go there and see what the most popular ones are. And I will find out about that. That would be useful, Marta. Um, we do have suggestions. We've written a lot on the blog before about what kind of typefaces to pair together. Mm -hmm. A lot of advice that is very useful. We also have Typekit Practice, which is run by Tim Brown, our head of typography. So if you go to practice.typekit.com, there are a few articles there that are useful to designers. Um, we really try to reach out and have content that's useful. Um, so I can suggest this and see if it's possible as well. That would be great, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm also interested. What are the faces that are being synced most often? That would be kind of cool to know. Yeah, I'm not sure what we are able to disclose. So sure. that's the only reason I'm hesitant about it. Sure. But OK. Yeah. Marta, I hope that helps. So that's the last question for now, and we will definitely keep it open for questions. Um, and Ari, I wanted to know if you could give us a little tour, if you could. Yeah. Would that be okay? Sure. Okay. So you can see where I sit every day. <laughs> I'm gonna leave this room. So you're in San Francisco, you're at the San Francisco office in Adobe, right? Or San yes, Jose? San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So, First of all, I'll show you. I don't want anyone to get sick by how okay. fast I'm moving. <laughs> um, this is the row that I sit on. So we have a beautiful view. Mm -hmm. um, this is my desk. I have a little unicorn 
<laughs> my little mascot. <laughs> Um, and one of the most important things is our bar. It's called the Descender. And because you descend while you're drinking. <laughs> exactly. Um, we had this sign specially made for us. And we also have a coffee bar, which is called the Ascender. Oh, smart. <laughs> which is right here. <laughs> so we spend a lot of time both working and enjoying these things. Um, this is what has remained of the type kit library. Oh, wow. We don't travel with it anymore, but we do have it here. And we can sit with our little plush toys on our couch <laughs> and read about typography anytime. <laughs> and this is generally the whole area. We have a really beautiful building which was which is now a landmark, the Baker Hamilton building. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this is our old type kit sign. Oh yeah. This from before type kit was acquired by Adobe. We still have it up. Um, so the building is really old and has this beautiful exposed brick um, that we really love. Yeah. And it's a great place to work. So you're upstairs, right? Yes, I'm on the third floor. You're on the third floor. Yeah. So, so who else is there in the in the building? I mean, what other teams? We have it's not really divided. You if you asked where teams were, a lot of them mm -hmm. would say, Oh, some of them are in San Jose, some of our people are here. But we have a lot of the creative cloud executive leadership here. Mm -hmm. Digital media, for the most part. So um, our head of digital media, a lot of the VPs for Creative Cloud, and then the services that are included in Creative Cloud, such as Typekit. Um, a lot of people who work on the main flagship products like Photoshop. It's kind of a cross-section of people. So, but the, most of the Typekit team is there? In, the Typekit team is... Um, mostly in San Francisco, but we have a lot of remote people. So there's about 10 to 15 people who work all over the country, Chicago, New York area, Boston, you name it. And oh, even nice. in Europe as well. So it's fun when we all get together. <laughs> and um, okay, so there's no other question. So I just want to ask another question. Um, what would you recommend for a new type designer getting into the business side of type in terms of developing fonts? Do you have any recommendations for them? Yeah, I would say that knowing about licensing is really important. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've noticed is that young designers, especially in design school, don't learn about licensing and how to protect your assets and creating a EULA, that kind of thing. It's not a really fun topic, so I don't think it gets covered enough. Um, that's one thing. Another is to decide on your strategy, whether you want to expose your fonts to as many people as you can or try to cultivate an independent brand. A lot of successful foundries have decided that, for example, they don't want to be on Typekit because they feel that they should only sell fonts on their own website mm -hmm. or that their fonts should have this exclusivity. And that strategy works for some. I feel that as, as new distribute, ways of distributing fonts are emerging, this might not be the best strategy, but a lot of people are still carrying on with it. Um, and then the other is to try to reach out to as many channels as you can and Typekit being one of them. Just try to get to more and more users because the only way you can do that is by diversifying and not only selling on your own website. Um, another thing that I think is important is finding your style. Um, I did say that diverse portfolios are something we look for, but diverse 
in a certain sense that you have something distinctive that people like. For example, Laura Worthington, she has her brand. It's very distinctive. It's very much her. Um, you look at any of her typefaces and you're like, oh yeah, that's an expression of herself and what she's passionate about. So I think that's something that everyone finds for themselves, but I like it when I see someone that has that identity and is able to express it really well. Um, and don't underestimate the business side. Hmm. Being savvy about that is really important. I see a lot of um, variation in how foundries approach contracts and payment rates and all that. A lot of them are like, thanks, I read that and it's been a day and I'm like, did you really read it? Do you know what you signed up for? And then a year later they ask questions that show that maybe they didn't read everything mm -hmm. and maybe they've misunderstood something that could cost them. Mm -hmm. um, we try to make sure to explain everything so that nobody's misunderstanding because I know that it's hard to get through all this legalese and business stuff. But I always feel bad when I see that, oh, you didn't read, like, you agreed <laughs> to that, you already signed it. You know, mm -hmm. like if you have a problem with that, you should have read more about it. Right. So to a young designer, I would say, don't underestimate that when you're signing a contract, get help. It's hard, it's really expensive to pay for a lawyer, mm -hmm. but if you can't do that, make sure that you really read everything that you're signing and ask questions. Just ask a lot of questions about all that stuff. And that's an interesting point to bring up. I mean, a lot of people, well, if I knew that I had a font on Typekit, I would probably just rush and go, okay, yeah, that looks good. Let's just get it on there and just be excited about the relationship. But mm -hmm. I totally understand that there is a business side and it's not just all marketing promotion or reputation that my font is on, you know, that I have a relationship with Adobe and whatnot. So that's, yeah. that's a really good tip. When, when you have a, a, a typeface um, on Typekit, that does mean you still can sell it and distribute it in other channels, right? Yes, we don't require any exclusivity. Okay, yeah. that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have four questions here. Um, and I just want to ask you, so uh, if there was a question you felt like it stand out was a very good question, then I think it would be a good idea to award yeah. um, the Creative Cloud subscription. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, let's see. I think that, hmm. so Anna is how you pronounce her name? Yeah. I think Anna and Marta's questions really made me think the most, okay. um, which is awesome and made me wonder about myself and our service. <laughs> um, so I would like to give Anna the subscription for okay. a year. Great. And thank you so much for participating and asking questions. And um, all we have to do is have the email and then, oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh my Yay! gosh, that's excellent. <laughs> Congratulations, Anna. All we need is her email. Okay. And then we can just send her a code and she'll okay. be able to type it in. Excellent. Well, I can yeah. definitely connect with you and get you that information. I'll also copy yeah. her on that information as well. So thank you so much. I know, congrats. <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> Oh, and I'm sure Marta was like, oh my gosh, that's so close. <laughs> I know. I feel really bad. I shouldn't. That's okay. <laughs> but that's I just good. wanted to say that it made me think. And Yeah, no, those are actually all of them were really, really yeah, great questions. Yeah, all of them were great. I mean, how can you even? It's really hard to choose. Right. Right. But Sorry it was just to put something different spot. that I thought was right. fun. Yeah. Right. And what's great is um, to have you on as something different as well. I mean, usually I talk to typeface designers and lettering people, graphic designers, and it's great to see the business side of type. That's something that we don't think about as graphic designers. I know that yeah. type designers do think about that. Um, but Typekit to me is usually invisible because it just works and it's in mm -hmm. the background. 
And I use it all the time. And it's something that I don't think about, oh, there was so much effort that goes into curating the library or bringing the typeface in, making it both for sync, uh, for desktop sync and also web. Mm -hmm. And also, how did I find out about the typeface to begin with? So there's a lot of things happening there that I don't, that you guys yeah. just make happen and I don't even think about it. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> You're welcome. I think it's the case with any work. Mm. You, everyone else sees the finished product and hopefully it works and then it's invisible. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing when something is just there and no one wonders about it. I don't want anyone to wonder. I just want them to sync the font and create something with it and enjoy it. Well, definitely it's very e It's much easier for me that it's part of the Creative Cloud suite mm -hmm. uh, because when, you were, when Typekit was separate, you had to remember to go to all these different services and to grab the JavaScript and to bring everything in in order yeah. to get it to work on your websites. And now it just works. So thank you yeah. so much. And we hope to be closer and closer to the other Adobe products as time goes on. To make and is there, more is there anything else you can tell us in terms of what's coming up in Typekit or any other developments? Maybe no, nothing. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I can't, but watch okay. this space. There's always stuff we're working on to make our customers happier. And I'm excited for everything that's coming. Great. Well, thank you, and we're we're excited about it as well. We'll keep an eye on the space and, yes. and let everyone know. So thank you so much for everyone to, who joined us today in the middle Thanks of the everyone. day. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, let everyone know uh, that the replay is also available here at this link, and you can share it out. And, and uh, it's a great conversation. Thank you so much, Ari. Good to see you. OK, bye. Bye. Thank you.